Just stand by, Daryl, okay? All right. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today, we have one of our most popular guests on. He's been on several times before, and he's going to be giving a wonderful talk on how you can actually reverse diabetes with a fork and knife. Please welcome back to the show my dear friend, Dr. Hans Deal. So good to see you, Dr. Deal. Well, thank you. It's always a joy being on your program. You really boost my self-esteem like nobody else. <laughs> well, you have a lot of wonderful qualities that need boosting. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, you are so interested in diabetes, aren't you? I am because, you know, diabetes today is the black plague of the 21st century. That's what somebody called it. Do you realize, let me see if I can show you one of the slides here. Uh, share, uh, let's see, what would we do in there here? Yeah, look at this, Chef AJ. We have 122 million people in this country that are either diabetics or pre-diabetics. I mean, that's every second American adult today either has diabetes or is a pre-diabetic on his or her way of developing a full-blown disease. And once you have diabetes, the curtain, I mean, is approaching um, ominously. Um, it's, it's an absolute tragedy because it doesn't have to be that way. You can reverse this disease in weeks in most cases if you're willing to make a few changes and begin to you know, take heed to some of the dietary concepts that you have been talking about for years now. And me too, right? Yeah. Hey, I just want to let you know, Dr. Deal, Juliet, said she took a class with you 22 years ago and she loves you. Oh, is that right? Wow. Well, <laughs> nice to hear this. You know, it's one of the great joys uh, when you are working in the lifestyle medicine area where you provide education and motivation and inspiration and people begin to pick it up. They understand. They say, for the first time, I understand why I need to do this. And so when they do it, five, 10, 20 years later, you know, they come to you and they say, look, it made a lot of difference and it's just a great joy from a professional you know point of view to think that you made a significant difference in turning a life around that was going down the hill and you bring it around to joy and health and happiness uh, just by opening up the floodgates of understanding so thank you juliet for tuning in so when you look at diabetes, uh, you see what happened in the last 40 years. I talk about the black plague of the 21st century. Diabetes is a new disease, basically. Uh, you can see here in 1945, it was very rare. Uh, then it began to really take off in 1980. Uh, and today, when you look at some of the older categories, uh, the mature years in people, you see a 400% increase in the last 40 years, and not only in America, but actually around the world, something is happening. And, you know, many of us think that it has to do with the change that we have made in our diet. I first woke up, so to speak, when I was working on the anesthesia service, learning how to put people to sleep. And I was seeing my patients for the next day's surgery for coronary artery bypass surgery in order to bypass clogged arteries in their heart. Because it was late at night, I drew the man's blood test. And when I took the blood to the laboratory and had it processed, I couldn't believe my eyes. Now, normally, this liquid layer floating on top of the blood clot is quite transparent. It's a yellow, but quite clear. You can see right through it. The blood in this patient's tube, however, was anything but clear. The serum floating on his clot was thick and greasy white. It looked like glue. In fact, it stuck to the sides of the blood tube when I shook the tube. I went back to the patient. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital tonight? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a cheeseburger and a milkshake. Oh my and when he said that, I realized that what I was looking at in his tube was all the fat in the beef burger, all the butter fat in the cheese, and the butter fat in the ice cream and in the milkshake. And all this fat had oozed out into his blood and actually turned his blood fatty. Well, 30, 40, 50 years of keeping your blood very fatty creates changes in the blood vessels that are very dangerous. Over the years, arteries can become clogged with fatty material. Then a blood clot can form, blocking the blood flow completely. 
If the artery leads to the heart, the lack of oxygen can cause heart muscle to die. That's a heart attack. If the clogged artery leads to the brain, the patient has a stroke. The next morning, we took Mr. Phillips to the operating room, and I put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest. And from these arteries, he began pulling out yellow, greasy deposits of fatty material called atherosclerosis. Did you see that? It's unbelievable. This is the underlying disease process called atherosclerosis, inflammation of the arteries of the circulatory system that is at the basis of most of our chronic diseases. And when you talk about chronic diseases, that means they're always going to be there, right? Yep. You can have all the medications, you can have all the referrals, you can have all the surgical procedures, but by and large, when it comes to chronic disease, once you're diagnosed, you're going to live with it and you're going to die with it. Except, except when you change how you use fork and knife, right? Absolutely. Diseases, yeah. of, I like to think of them as diseases of culinary medicine. You're right, 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 right. Abusing the kind of precious foods that are supplied to us by nature, but we set them aside and we replace them with engineered foods. We go from foods to products, right? And then we also have dramatically shifted our supply of animal products. We have almost doubled the supply over the last 100 years. So when you have these kind of things happening, you have more animal products coming in with its cholesterol and with the high fat content and no fiber and so on. And at the same time, you're shifting from regular foods like uh, fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes, and you shift from there to industrialized products. You know, this is what you find. You see it right there. You see the deadly plagues? plaques? Yeah, this yeah. is going on the inside of the arteries. And, uh, you know, by the time a person in America is 20 years of age, you already has 20% of atherosclerosis. By the time you're 45, you have 60%. By the time you have 70%, oftentimes that's the first time when you have 70% narrowing of the arteries, the coronary arteries in particular, that the first sign of disease tries to shake you up. It's called angina pectoris. Now, why do I talk to you about heart disease? because it's directly related to diabetes. Because you see here this, um, this horseshoe, this arch, these are determinants of atherosclerosis. And you look on the left side, the higher you are on that arch, the more powerful they are. So the big three is cholesterol. And then the right hand side, you have high blood pressure. On the left side, you have smoking. Then you have, what is it? Uh, sorry, I've been watching the chat. I'm so sorry, but I but I did notice that it's funny that that's an arch because it makes me think of the golden arches, which also causes disease. Oh my goodness! Yeah, hey, let's get on this one here. See, the the big drivers of atherosclerosis, the underlying disease process, is cholesterol, high blood pressure, and smoking, and then you have the next one on the left side. I need to put my glasses on. I can't see it. Hold on. A little hard for me to see. I'm so sorry, Dr. Deal, because it's very small. It's very small on my screen. Oh, really? Yeah, but, but okay, it's not, it's not what other, other people are seeing it a lot larger. It's just that I have a couple okay. of different screens. Oh, okay, on. okay. So the next one is diabetes and then obesity. These are the drivers of the disease. So diabetes is a promoter of atherosclerosis, of narrowing of the circulatory system. And here you see what happens. You see the artery system there. You go from the top all the way down and you see the cerebral arteries are being clogged up. And then you have the eyes, uh, the arteries to the eyes, the arteries to the, uh, to the brain, the arteries to the heart, the arteries to the kidneys, the arteries to the uh, legs, the arteries to the male sex organ, all of these. These are all related to atherosclerosis. And these are all diseases that emerge then. They have different names. They're in different places, but it's the same disease, the same underlying pathology, which is atherosclerosis. And so that's why on this slide, I usually talk about perfect health depends on perfect circulation. And now comes the important slide here. 
because once you understand that atherosclerosis is the common denominator for many of these common chronic diseases, then you begin to look at diabetes. And what do you find? Diabetes promotes atherosclerosis, so it affects the arteries to the eye. So you're not surprised, are you, that diabetes is a number one cause of blindness in America. Yeah. Diabetes is pushing kidney disease to the extent that it's 18 times more common in people that have atherosclerosis and diabetes. Also, diabetes then pushes heart disease and stroke forward, increasing it by two to four times. And of course, impotence, you know, we all know what that is all about, right? Yeah, things are going south. Yep. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and oftentimes, uh, uh, the impotence uh, that is affecting very prominently uh, diabetic men because it affects the vascular structure of the male sex organ. You know, those kind of little vessels inside the, the, the penal arteries, they're much, much smaller than the coronary arteries. And so that becomes oftentimes the, uh, what do they call this? The canary in the, in the coal mine? Yep, that's it, Dr. It, it, Terry Mason used to correct, call it. Uh -huh. Correct, correct, correct. It, it kind of uh, proceeds it announces that something has happened to the vascular structures all over the body, including in your foot and leg. And so then when you have diabetes, it becomes the number one cause of foot and leg amputations. Hearing impairment, it's all there. So when you look at diabetes and the complications, you have to think about blindness, you have to think about kidney disease, heart disease, stroke, impotence, foot and leg amputations, hearing impairment. It's an absolutely devastating situation in terms of the undermining of your of your quality of life and then of course it also reduces your life expectancy uh in men and women it's between 11 to 14 15 years that people live shorter lives because of diabetes so it's a very devastating disease it's the black black plague of the 21st century now you know that there are different kinds of diabetes, right? Absolutely. Type 1, type 2. Yeah. And you know the proportion, right? Type 1 is usually about 5% or so. Uh, and then you have uh, the majority of the diabetics. They have what we call on adult onset diabetes. We used to call it that adult onset because we found it usually in people that are 50, 60 years of age and overweight. Yeah. And now kids are getting it. Now, kids are getting it. I mean, people are now, we have to look for diabetics when people are overweight and they are 40 years of age, 30 years of age, 20 years of age, 15 year olds have now diabetes, type two diabetes. And we no longer call it adult onset, we call it now type two because it no longer matches with the ages, right? Because the disease is getting into the younger and younger groups because of the obesity epidemic. And then what do we do? So we diagnose a diabetic, and then what do we do next? We put on medication, right? So you have insulin shots. Uh, they usually come a little bit later, but first you have the pills. 62% of the diabetics are on pills. About another 10% are on pills and insulin. 14% of them are on insulin injections. And is it solving the problem? No. Nope. No. What do you see there? Can you see this one? Is it? Yeah, it's uh, mopping up the floor without turning the water off. Yeah, isn't it amazing? Now look at this. This is what we do in medicine. I'm sorry to say when it comes to chronic disease. You know, we're always mopping up. We, we have the symptoms before us. People feel terrible. They're depressed. Uh, they're in pain. And we do everything we can. And that's really, really good and important. However, it doesn't turn the disease around. It just takes care of the symptoms, but not the cause. You know, when you look at these uh, pipes there uh, coming from the ceiling, what do you really need here? You don't need a physician. You need, you need a plumber. plumber. <laughs> yeah, that's right, isn't it? Uh, and you know, the good news is that we can be the plumbers. We have to be the plumbers because we can turn the disease off with fork and knife. We are in charge. We can work with a physician who is enlightened and understand the disease process, let him work with us, but we have the responsibility of deciding what are we gonna put at the end of our fork and knife and spoon. Is that right? Indeed. Well, that's what you've been teaching all these years, haven't you? 
That's absolutely. Yeah. And so that comes then with education, with um, understanding, uh, hopefully leads to motivation to swim against the current of the American diet as it is today. The standard American diet is a sad story, isn't it? Yep, SAD, substance abuse diet. Oh, substance abuse diet. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? Substance abuse, legal substance abuse, and it looks so good, and it tastes so good, and nobody knows it's destroying you from the inside out, pushing the atherosclerotic plaques on the inside, pushing the high blood pressure, pushing the diabetes, and so on. Yeah. And so here you see type 2 diabetes, what do we do? You know, many people think that if I just have the doctor give me the right drug, oh, I'm going to be okay. It doesn't stop the epidemic. It doesn't stop the disease. And many of these uh, medications, they all have side effects. Many people don't know when they are finally arriving at the medication or at, in the end, usually it's, it's insulin. These are all, except for one drug, they're all promoting weight gain. And what we yes. have found is that weight, excess weight, is one of the direct precursors and drivers of the diabetes. So let me just do a little review with you of uh, how we can create diabetes. You know, if, if I had uh, a challenge, um, I have some medical students and they said, sir, how can you create diabetes? You know what I would do? I said, are you ready to do an experiment with me? Yes, sir. So I divided the class into two halves, okay? And uh, half of the class, we give them a very high fat diet. Actually, actually it's about 65% fat. The American diet is about 35% fat. We really double it, right? I mean, really go all out. A high fat diet, hash browns, salami, cheese, cream, ice cream, you know, margarines, butters. I mean, we really give them everything they want. It tastes good, it's smooth. Shh. That's one class. That's one portion of the class. The other half, here's what we give to them. We give them sugar, pastry, candy, white bread, bananas. We give them some baked potatoes, some brown rice. We give them some oatmeal. Uh, and then we wait for two weeks and we take their blood sugars every day. And after about 10 days, 14 days, what do you think happened? The group that becomes diabetic has more diabetics than the other class, group. They're in the class that are on the high fat diet. And you say, that cannot be. I mean, we all know that sugar is related to diabetes, right? Right? That's what people think. Yeah. Well, it goes back to Egypt. That's thousands of years ago. Because the priests who were the physicians then to the pharaohs, when the pharaoh didn't feel so well, he had gained weight, he's lived a good life, he was overweight now, and the uh, priest would ask for a urine sample, and they pour it on the sand, and they wait for the ants to come. If the ants come to where the urine was poured, they know the pharaoh has diabetes, because the sugar spills in advanced diabetes through the urine out. So that's why we have this connection, aha, a person spills, urine, spills sugar in the urine, diabetic. It must be the sugar that the person is eating. Not true. It's shocking. What we have found more recently is that it is not so much the sugar, of course, that doesn't really help us. There's no nutrition value to sugar as such. Uh, but we have found that if you really want to create diabetics, all you have to do is give them a high fat, a very high fat diet. And add some sugar, yeah, it sweetens it up and uh, it adds a little bit extra to it uh, to make it even faster. But we have found in controlled experiment that goes back to the 1930s, we have found that um, when you add fat in the diet, the patient's sensitivity to insulin depreciates, it goes down. And if you begin to decrease the fat in the, uh, in the diet, the uh, blood sugar levels actually drop. So there's a direct relationship between the amount of fat in the diet and the blood sugars that you have that will then identify you 
to be either a diabetic or not a diabetic. <clears throat> so let me just take you to Harvard, uh, this famous nurse's study. There are some close to 100,000 pre-diabetics. They followed them for 16 years. And out of these 85,000 pre-diabetics, 30,300 became full-blown diabetics. Okay, so you got the idea? People are pre-diabetics. They have blood sugars between 100 and 130. So they are pre-diabetics on their way to diabetes. And then they found that over the next 16 years, 3,300 become full-blown diabetics. What do you think made the difference? How, do you, how can you identify the people that would become diabetics? Was it, was it their BMI? Yeah, exactly right. They found if they took the people with the highest BMI with the most um, excess weight versus those that had the least excess weight, the differential was 40 times. So if you were at the high category of overweight versus the lowest ones, you had 40 times more people moving towards diabetes out of a pre-diabetic state. I mean, this is big time, right? Fat is a big, big factor. Fat that you carry and fat that is getting into the actual cell. Here you see this is a muscle cell and I don't want to get into all the details, uh, but there's insulin that is supposed to open up some of the uh, special uh, glucose uh, uh, entry points. And when you have a lot of uh, fat getting into the cell itself, you see the yellow uh, portions there. Um, that interferes with the uh, insulin being able to open up the entry points and to allow glucose to come into the cell. The cells are dependent on glucose, just like a car is dependent on getting gas into the tank. So glucose, blood sugar, the sugar that is in the blood that goes into the cell, that's where it's supposed to be. That's the destiny. But once you are no longer... Uh, allowing the insulin to open up the entry points for the glucose to bring energy to the cells. Uh, say, you talk to diabetics, they always say, oh, I'm so tired. I don't know what to do. Uh, I have no energy and I'm eating and I'm eating. It's not that I'm lacking calories. No, I have enough calories, but the problem is the glucose is building up in the bloodstream instead of getting into the cells where it can provide the energy for the muscles to operate properly. Any questions? Well, there's lots of questions, but I'd like you to finish your slide presentation and then I'll ask the ones in the chat if you don't mind. Okay, 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 very good. Here's another one. This is the famous DPP study. This is the diabetes prevention program for, you know, take a look at this. Uh, what they did, uh, they uh, selected this is a huge experiment, uh, very famous experiment, uh, was done in many, many, many uh, university uh, clinical centers. Uh, they found a total a group of 3000 plus obese pre-diabetics. Now these are obese pre-diabetics. And they said, how long will it take before they become diabetics? Remember in the other study, we talked about 16 years. This is now a three year study because these people start off as very obese pre-diabetics. Here's what they found. People were divided into three groups. <clears throat> One group didn't get any intervention. They said, whatever you do, keep doing what you're doing. You're the control group. And 29% of these obese pre-diabetics would become diabetics in three years. So let's remember that. One third of the people that are obese pre-diabetics within three years become usually diabetics unless they do something about it. So then they have a second group. Uh, this is the control group. Now we have a second group and they put them on a, the most commonly used diabetic drug called metformin. So they wanna see how metformin works. And while the control group, 29% became full-blown diabetics, with metformin, only 21% became full-blown diabetics. So metformin helps, doesn't it? Goes from 29% to 21%. Then they had this third group, and these researchers were kind of curious, what would happen if we help these people just to lose some weight and get an exercise program about, you know, 150 minutes a week? It's not a lot, is it? 150 uh, minutes a week, that's about 30 minutes a day. So walk every day for 30 minutes and lose a few pounds. And this is called the lifestyle group. 
That's not a very aggressive lifestyle intervention, right? That's a very mild program. Lose a little bit of weight, get into a walking program 30 minutes a day. And then they found out over the next three years, instead of being 29% becoming diabetics, instead of 21% become diabetics with metformin, when you use the lifestyle approach, only 14% become full-blown diabetics. So which is winning the competition here? Which is the most effective uh, therapeutic agent? Metformin or lifestyle medicine, lifestyle change. And this is a mild change. You know, when we talk about reversing diabetes, we're not just talking about a little bit of exercise. We're talking about at least an hour a day. When we talk about lifestyle change, we're making a radical change in the diet, not just a little bit of weight loss. We want them to lose two pounds a week by making some dietary changes. So then you have the, uh, the large Harvard study that enrolled some 200,000 people over a period of 10 years. And here's what they found. They found that people who were using as little as two ounces of processed red meat, what would you call that? Processed red meat? Hot bacon, dog, hot bacon. Dog, bacon, salami, pizzas, right? Two ounces of processed red meat a day. Two, that's not very much, is it? Two ounces. No, no, no. Those who consumed about two ounces of processed red meat increased the diabetes by 50%. And then uh, they said, well, why don't we shift and we replace the red meat with a whole grain dish, okay? So what are you gonna eat? Bulgur wheat, you have some oatmeal, <clears throat> uh, maybe you have some seven grain cereal, and the, the diabetes decreased by 35% because this was now a very, very low fat diet. So again, Processed red meat, that's usually 70 to 80% of the red meat is fat. You know these sausages? You have cheese, it's 70% fat. These all promote actually um, excess weight. It interferes with the uh, proper working of the insulin and you are on your way to become a diabetic. So <clears throat> we've talked a little bit about um, uh, the kind of diabetes, type one, type two. 90% of the diabetics are type two. That's related to obesity, right? And a high fat diet we suggested. So let's take a look at uh, what Dr. Professor James Anderson uh, talked about. And he has done this for the last 40 years. I heard him once, first time I heard him was in 1980 here at Loma Linda at the university at a special uh, medical convention. And he said, this is 1980. He had just visited the Pritikin program and he got inspired. He did some research and he found out and he said, probably 50 to 75% of diabetics on insulin, these are type two diabetics, 50 to 75% of these people on insulin and 80 to 90% of those on pills could bring their blood sugars down to normal and be off medication within weeks. He talked about three to 10 weeks. And all they have to do is change their diet towards foods as ground. Now, this is for you now. Uh, uh, I want you to help me with this. Uh, uh, tell me, AJ, uh, when we talk about foods as ground, what would you recommend? What would you say are foods as ground that people should eat if they want to do something about diabetes? Well, I learned from you, it's food that comes from a plant rather than food that's manufactured in a plant. Fruits, oh, wait, vegetables. Wait, 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 wait. My goodness, this is profound. Now say that again. Foods that come from a plant rather yes. than foods that are manufactured in a plant. Oh, that's pretty clever. So you're talking about real food versus engineered foods. Yes, foods, as you say, foods as grown. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains. You mean something as simple as moving towards plants or a diet that has more plants as they come in nature, like we're talking about fruits? Yep. Fruits for, for diabetics, that's right. Because there's fiber in there. Then we talk about vegetables, low in fat, high in fiber. <clears throat> we're talking about whole grains, we already talked about the study at Harvard, right? 
<coughs> where they replace meat with uh, whole grains. And then number four, we talk about beans. Would beans fit into a program of dealing with diabetes? You betcha. Big, All legumes. Big time. You know, we recommend that in our CHIP program, diabetics should at least have every day at least one serving of beans or lentils or some of these kind of uh, legumes because they have, a, they have the magical component that's called soluble fiber. Soluble fiber is outstanding. Soluble fiber is changing the metabolism of the food, how it's being digested. And I'll come to it in just a minute. Here it is. Can you see this? It says all carbs are not equal. What do we mean? What do you think? Well, I mean, the fiber, for example, I mean, one is processed, one is refined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, one is unprocessed, one is unrefined. Yeah. When we talk about carbohydrates, as, as you have always talked about, uh, you have either simple carbohydrates or <clears throat> complex carbohydrates, right? Exactly. You have the simple carbohydrates. These are the sugars. And then you have the complex carbohydrates. These are the starches. These are starches are actually kind of thousands and thousands of little uh, sugar molecules kind of things put together into a large, uh, large molecule. And that's what we call it complex carbohydrates. And these are the starches. Now, when you look at this chart, you begin to see the simple sugars begin to break down into whole foods as grown or refined sugars processed. You know, uh, we, we call whole foods, even even simple sugar foods, foods high in simple carbohydrates like wal walnuts and uh, raspberries and uh, uh, mangoes and cherries. These are whole foods, the foods as grown and a diabetic can eat these foods because they're also high in fiber. But once you refine them and you turn grapes into raisins, now you're concentrating the sugar that was before diluted in the grape. Once you take uh, bananas and you uh, dehydrate them and you put them into, you fry them even with some fat, now they're refined. It's a totally different compound. So these are the sugars. Eat sugars as they come in nature, whole foods as they come in nature to us. Then on the other hand, you have complex carbohydrates. These are the starches. And here again, you see refined starches and whole foods as grown starchy foods, right? So when you refine whole grains, when you take a kernel of wheat, you turn it into white flour, you have now removed the fiber very effectively. And that carbohydrate, that starch turns into sugar very rapidly. And it is really very, making it very, very hard for a person not to have the blood sugar spiking very rapidly within 15, 20, 30 minutes. On the other hand, if you have the wheat or the uh, quinoa, or you have the millet, you have these whole grains, foods as grown, they have all the fiber and the magic of fiber slows down the degradation, the digestion of these foods. And it takes about an hour to two hours and the body can handle that beautifully. And you don't have to worry about these starches, unrefined starches turning into sugar very rapidly and promoting the cause of the, the you know, the, the, the promotion of diabetes. It's a magical thing. So the point I wanna uh, sort of summarize here is you need to make the distinction between refined carbohydrates, regardless of whether they are simple or complex versus whole food unrefined carbohydrates. Right. That's very, very essential. Yeah, because all, carbs, about, all yeah. carbs are not created equal. Yeah, you've talked about it for years in your books, in your lectures. Not all carbohydrates are equal. You have to distinguish between refined carbohydrates, the sugary drinks, right? Fruit juices. These are refined. Some of the fiber has been sort of taken out. You have concentrated the calories. And when it comes to the starchy foods, you have to distinguish between white flour products, you know, the cakes, the pies, the pizza crusts versus 
the unrefined complex carbohydrates, the unrefined starchy foods, such as whole grains in general. Well, here's the American diet. You see 51% of the calories that we eat are refined processed foods. I mean, this is a perfect prescription for developing diabetes and obesity. And then you have another 35%, you see it there, 26 plus nine, 35% of the calories usually come from mixed food, particularly dairy and animal foods. They're high in fat and they have no fiber. And then what's really shocking to me is that only about 10 to 14% of the calories that we eat in America today are coming from whole fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Foods as, foods as, foods grown. as. Grown, foods as grown. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You see only 14, 10 to 14% of the calories we eat comes from foods as grown as they appear in nature. <clears throat> and if we can begin to move more towards what naturally comes to us uh, in nature, I think we would have all the ingredients that will help us to protect us from the uh, diabetes. So let's talk a little bit about reversing diabetes. You mean you can reverse diabetes? I mean, you don't have to rely on medication. As a matter of fact, it's dangerous to stay on medication when you're following a program of natural foods because the natural foods are so powerful. They bring the blood sugars down within three to four to five days. So that if you don't make a reduction in your medication, you can become hypoglycemic. You begin to shake. So when you are beginning to move towards a more natural diet, foods has grown, you have to work very closely with your nurse, with your physician uh, that takes care of your diabetes and say, I'm following a high fiber diet. I'm reducing my calories. I'm eating more food, but of the right kind. And I want you to really uh, stand by as the blood sugars will drop. You probably have to reduce the medication and that's what they have to do. And the physicians are usually absolutely, I mean, they don't understand. They say, I don't understand. Uh, why is your blood sugar dropping? This is dangerously low now. Well, maybe you ought to reduce the medication because the diet is not taking over as the new medicine. Are you with me there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this goes back to 1933. Uh, you know, uh, this Dr. Rabinowitz, he was a famous Canadian uh, physician. <clears throat> he was able to take people off insulin uh, within weeks. By, by doing what? By putting them on a very, very low fat diet. Uh, the uh, diet was usually 10 to 15% fat. That's about half the amount of fat and grease that was in the usual diet that people had that were diabetics. Then take a look in 1955. This is a very famous study by Dr. Inder Singh. Here's what he did. He had 80 patients on insulin. These were type two diabetics. And he put them on a very, very low fat diet, just like Dr. Ornish, Dr. Esselstein, Nathan Pritikin used to do, uh, Dr. Barnard. They all use these very, very low fat whole food diets, high fiber diets. And this is what he did in 1955. This is now 50, 60, 70 years ago almost. Out of the 80 diabetic patients, 50 of these patients were off all insulin within six weeks. It's amazing, Dr. Deal. AJ, think about this. In those days, 1955, these insulin needles were like horse needles. They were large, they were painful. You had to find injection sites in your abdominal area, your thighs. I mean, this was painful. And within six weeks, 62%, 50 out of 80 patients are no longer on insulin. They're no longer on medication. And then over the next uh, you know, 12 weeks, about 18 weeks later, 85% of all of these patients on insulin are off insulin. I mean, this is an amazing thing. Why don't we do this? Here's Dr. James Anderson again. You know, I talked to you about him already. He suggested that probably 50 to 75% of the diabetics on insulin could be off insulin within weeks. He took 28 patients on insulin. They took 14 to 32 units of insulin every day. And he put them on a very, very high fiber, high starch diet, but unrefined starch and very low in fat. And within three weeks, 
22 of the diabetics out of 28 were off insulin. I mean, it's all scientific documented since 1927, but somehow we overlooked it. We got so entrenched with the pharmaceutical approach. We can take these pills, we can take the injections here. When they, we don't have to change the diet, we can do, eat anything we want to eat. Now, wait a minute. You're always going to be a diabetic. You always have to worry about amputations and blindness and impotence as a man and kidney disease and losing 10 to 15 years of your life and you're on dialysis the last five years of your life, folks, how much easier it is to make just a few simple changes and decide what you put at the end of your spoon and of your fork and eat foods as they come in nature instead of fattening up the food that comes, that is made in plants, as you call it, right? Manufactured foods versus foods as they come in nature. Cutting back on animal products, the cheeses, the eggs, you know, the meats, cut back on these uh, uh, sausages and so on, and eat more fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes, and maybe have a few nuts and drink lots of water and, you know, get into an exercise program. And here's your prescription for reversing diabetes. I used to work with Nathan Pritikin in the 1980s. Uh, here you see 74% uh, of the patients on type two that were type two diabetics on oral drugs, pills. 74% of these patients within less than four weeks were off the medication. I mean, I was stunned seeing this. That's incredible. I'm so jealous that you knew Nathan Pritikin. I would have loved to have met him. I mean, it was a kind of a genius that looked beyond the symptomatic approach. He was an engineer. He said, why do we have so many diabetics? Why? What's the formula for turning it around? Well, in medicine, oftentimes we look at it, we want to make the patient feel more comfortable and we provide symptomatic relief, which is wonderful, but it's not enough, right? So Pritikin looked at it differently as sort of an engineer and that he was. He was not a physician. And he found that in the program there, within less than four weeks, 44 diabetics on insulin went home without any injections anymore. And they did two-year follow-up studies. 80% were still off the medications. You know, a few fell off the wagon, perhaps. Or they thought, well... That's incredible. It is. But you've gotten results like that with your chip program too. Well, yeah, before, well, thank you, thank you. Well, maybe I should mention, I didn't want to be self-serving, but <laughs> here's Dr. Barnard, and he has written the book, uh, uh, Reversing Diabetes, the scientifically proven system for reversing diabetes without drugs. What does he do? He follows basically sort of a pretty good type of a program that we're now using in lifestyle medicine very consistently, very low fat, whole foods, lots of fiber. And, you know, he had 71% of his diabetic patients off medications, off the pills in 26 days. It's just like what Prudkin showed, right? Incredible. 70%, 75%. These are not just some anecdotal little studies with some cherry picking. No. I just give you a few highlights of these studies out there. Then you have the CHIP program. You know, I, I know something about that, I guess. Um, we have 100,000 uh, people enrolled in the CHIP program over time for the last 35 years. And here you see we had 525 diabetics. <clears throat> they came into the program, and 30 days later, there were only 301 diabetics. What do you think happened to those 224 people that were no longer diabetics? They all they went, died? <laughs> they went on to teach the CHIP program. <laughs> Yeah, they, they went on the CHIP program and the high fiber and the low fat diet, uh, high in starch, unrefined starch was able to give these people a new uh, lease on life. Just 30 days, 200 out of 500 diabetics are no longer diabetics, which means about 43% are no longer in the diabetic range. Well, I want to close with a couple of uh, cases here, if that's okay. Um, 
this is a lady uh, here near Loma Linda where uh, I live and work. Uh, she came into the program. Uh, she was totally uh, desperate. She said, I don't know what to do. She said, uh, in 2009, I used to weigh 273 pounds. I was diabetic. I was taking 30 units of insulin. I was taking two or three different uh, pills for high, blood, for, uh, high uh, blood sugars. I was on two medications for my high blood pressure. Um, I was taking... Uh, uh, a drug uh, for a statin drug for my cholesterol. I was taking something for my angina pain and I had severe claudication, which means that your muscles in your leg are cramping up and you have a very hard time walking. She said, I could walk for six minutes and then I would cramp up and that was it. Well, she comes into our CHIP program and uh, in due time, um, she uh, is only 226 pounds. And uh, then in November, this is now six, seven, 10 months later, she has lost 60 pounds. Uh, she is off all insulin. She is off all of her medication except for metformin. We're taking the, the doctor's keeping her on half a dose. The blood pressure medications are gone. You see zero, zero, zero. The statin drug is gone. No more need for cholesterol or medication. It's zero. She's taking aspirin just for good measure. The uh, angina pain is gone. And she can now walk 120 minutes without stopping. She can walk for two hours and no cramping of her muscles in her legs. And she said, once I understood the disease, once I understood what caused this problem of diabetes, once I recognized that these were lifestyle things that I could do, once I began to understand that I was in charge, I did it and I just couldn't believe my good fortune. <clears throat> she said, I'm walking now um, every day, an hour. Uh, I have been introduced to the plant-based whole food diet. I eat lots of starches, but the right kind of starches, right? Right? Yeah, that's the whole potato. grains. Yep. Seven grains, oats, oatmeal, whole grains. And she said, I'm now a woman of joy. I'm quoting her. Uh, I am now a woman of joy, hope, and longevity. So here it is. Here are the stats. Here are the medications. But let's go beyond that. You know, this is a human being, right? She said, I went from pain, all these cramps in my legs and chest pain from the narrowed arteries in my heart to being pain-free. Number two, I went from large medical costs, I had eight drugs there, to minimal costs, I was just taking two small medications now. Number three, I went from eating less, well, what do you know? AJ, we have talked about for, that for years. Eat if more, weigh weight, less, yep. If you, want to, if you want to lose weight, what? You got to eat more, but of the right exactly. foods. Exactly, but the right foods, right? Foods as grown. So then number four, she said, I went from sugar and starch to high fiber, unrefined starch, right? Foods as grown. Number five, I, meant, I went from medical dependency to autonomy and freedom. She said, nobody knows what that means. You don't have to check in all the time. You have to worry about the medications. You have to worry about your blood sugars. You have to test three times a day. It's gone. And she said, number six, I went from being a semi-invalid to fully employed again, fully alive. I enjoy life. I feel like a totally new being. I used to be half dead. Now I'm fully alive. And she said, number seven, I went from hopelessness and despair to hope health and healing. I mean, this is what, what gladdens our heart, doesn't it, uh, Chef AJ? It's so inspiring because we have somebody watching named Leah who says she feels like a hopeless failure. It's not hopeless if you change your diet. It's all there. And just in case uh, you might want to hear a professor of medicine talk about this, here's a little chip for you. It's about eight minutes long, nine minutes long. So just brace yourself. Do we have nine minutes? We sure do, all the time you need, Dr. Deal. Hello, I'm Dr. Roger Greenlaw, and I would like to share with you a story from my practice. We'll be hearing about the health benefits of a high fiber diet in a 76-year-old woman with multiple lifestyle-related diseases. 
It had started several years ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago. I began gaining weight. That's the first thing I noticed. And with that weight gain, I developed some high blood pressure. And soon the doctors were talking to me about high cholesterol. And um, not too long after that, I started to um, develop what I thought were cardiovascular symptoms. I was very, very tired. I couldn't walk very much of a distance before I had to sit down. I would be out of breath. Uh, very soon after that, I developed uh, symptoms of diabetes. After several years of that, I started to have even more complications that come with high blood pressure and diabetes. I started to have eye problems, what they call diabetic retinopathy. So I did uh, go to a nephrologist and he suggested that my kidney function tests indicated um, that I w was going into kidney failure. In fact, I was at stage four, um, which sort of puts you right at the edge of needing uh, dialysis and or a kidney transplant. Finally, one Sunday, I lost vision in my right eye and at the same time had a problem with my right arm. There was some pain there and I couldn't use it very easily. So uh, then they ran more serious tests and finally did an angiogram. And at that time they found many, many seven or eight blood vessels that needed to be replaced and um, then went out to tell my husband and daughter they would have to do open heart surgery and take veins from my leg and replace those blocked blood vessels in my heart. And they did that in short order. In addition to what I saw as very serious health problems, I did start to develop some digestive problems along the way. And I took some over-the-counter type medications for that and it didn't seem to help much. So by the time that I made an appointment to see Dr. Greenlaw and talk about the colonoscopy, I also... Oh. Oh, we lost it. Yeah, it stopped us, unfortunate, it stopped it. Hello, I'm Dr. Roger Greenlaw, and I would like to share with you a story from my practice. Can you hear it? Can you see I'm it? I'm hearing about the health benefits of a high fiber. Uh. Uh, technology. Suggested that my kidney function tests indicated um, that I was going into kidney failure. In fact, I was at stage four, um, which sort of puts you right at the edge of needing uh, dialysis and or a kidney transplant. Finally, one Sunday, I lost vision in my right eye and at the same time had a problem with my right arm. There was some pain there and I couldn't use it very easily. So uh, then they ran more serious tests and finally did an angiogram. And at that time, they found many, many seven or eight blood vessels that needed to be replaced. And um, then went out to tell my husband and daughter they would have to do open heart surgery and take veins from my leg and replace those blocked blood vessels in my heart. And they did that in short order. In addition to what I saw as very serious health problems, I did start to develop some digestive problems along the way. And I took some over-the-counter type medications for that, and it didn't seem to help much. So by the time that I made an appointment to see Dr. Greenlaw and talk about the colonoscopy, I also had many other digestive problems to discuss. Now I would like to tell you about the medications that Beverly was taking. 
She was on four different medications for high blood pressure. One of them causes potassium to be lost from the body, so she was also taking a potassium supplement. In addition, she was on a trial of Lipitor for cholesterol elevation. Let's focus for a moment on Beverly's diabetes. She was insulin dependent, not only taking long-acting insulin every day, but several times during the day, she required injections of regular insulin to control her blood sugars. And remember, she had complications of her diabetes. I had so many things that I really didn't know what to work on next to try to keep under control. I was so worried about myself that that's, and how I was feeling and what I was gonna do if this thing progressed or if I couldn't get those kidneys under control or um, if, if the veins that they had replaced the arteries with in my heart uh, blocked again. So I really was in a hopeless situation and I knew I had to make some firm decisions and life changes. In our discussions, it was obvious to Beverly and it was obvious to me that she had exhausted all the traditional medical interventions that could help with her diseases and complications. She was asking me, what could I do that would improve my situation? Now we talked about lifestyle change her nutrition, her exercise, what stresses were going on in her life. And could she make some changes that might begin to address her diseases? And she was interested. I recommended that she try the CHIP program, and she agreed. As Beverly and I talked about lifestyle change, therapeutic lifestyle change, we talked about her multiple diseases and how the CHIP program could address all of those. The idea that if you treat one problem with a lifestyle change, you begin to treat all problems simultaneously that are lifestyle related. And that seemed like a perfect idea for Beverly's situation. Now for the really fun part of this story. Beverly signed up to take the CHIP program in September and October of 2009. And I would like to share with you some of her laboratory data. In the beginning, her cholesterol was 263, and after the CHIP program, it was down to 170. When we looked out five months later, it was 202, and a year after that, 178. It is not unusual for people's numbers to improve with some ups and downs over time, and she has continued to improve. Notice her weight loss at the end of the CHIP program was 15 pounds, Five months later, 25 pounds. And then in February, a year later, 40 pounds off. And in June of 2012, 57 pounds off. And that's where she leveled out. Notice the dress size going from 18 to 16 to 14 and then 12. And now she's shopping in the size eight to 10 rack. Then I noticed that I could eat a great deal uh, without taking more insulin. The other thing I noticed is I seem to be losing weight, eating more, but losing weight. And that gave me some encouragement. I think probably just in the first weeks, you know, I lost 10 pounds or more. As I became more involved with the program, um, I, I noticed that I could get the uh, blood sugar levels under control. That, that was a big thing for me. And um, I was feeling a lot better. The big story here is that she's off insulin and controlling her diabetes with metformin and lifestyle change alone. And let's not forget that Beverly was suffering from severe complications of her diabetes. With the taking of the CHIP program, the laser treatments stopped. And over the next two or three years, not one laser treatment was necessary. Her ophthalmologist was stunned at that result because that is so seldom seen in traditional medicine. 
then the neuropathy, that, that was a problem. In the auditorium where we had our CHIP program, there were steps, and every time we went to our seats or, or got up to get water or have a break, uh, we would uh, use those steps, and I needed help a lot of the times because I couldn't feel the steps, the steps themselves in my feet, with my feet, if I couldn't see them, I wouldn't know they were there. And so someone noticed and gave me some help when I needed to um, get up out of my seat. And now it's so different because even if I change socks and I have heavier socks on or lighter socks, I can feel the fibers <laughs> in the socks. And it was something I couldn't feel before. Just recently, um, the doctor checked my feet as, with the little wire where to see how your um, neuropathy is, if it's progressing, and he could find no evidence of it at all. Neuropathy is something most people would say is not able to be improved by medical therapy. You would use pain medicine to control the discomfort, but you would not expect neuropathy to go away. And in Beverly's case, her neuropathy steadily improved till it is now no longer an issue in her life. Incidentally, her heartburn improved within two weeks of starting the CHIP program. I would have been happy before I started CHIP if any of the diseases that I've talked about would have been helped, even to any degree. That's how desperate I was. And now I see that not only the diseases were, some of them reversed, all of them improved, that's for sure, but um, it changed me as a person. I see myself sort of as CEO and president and chairman of the board of all the decisions that are made for my body and do everything I can to make the right decisions day by day. Wow, that's quite something, isn't it? Empowered through education, motivated, finding the answers at the end of the fork and spoon. Beverly, 10 years later, is 86 years of age. On all these medications, multiple problems. She said, I would get up in the morning and pray, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen next. But that's all behind her now because she joined the CHIP program and made all the difference. We have published more than 50 scientific articles in medical journals about the power of um, making lifestyle changes affecting chronic diseases in reversing them in closing. I think we wanted to get the message across to you that a whole food, plant, strong diet that's also very low in fat and high in fiber offers the single most powerful and effective remedy to prevent and reverse type two diabetes. You wanna know more? Here's what you can do. You can just download the CHIP Optimal Diet Guide if you wanna take this down. We'll leave it there for a few seconds. <clears throat> just go to CHIP Health. CHIP stands for Complete Health Improvement Program. ChipHealth.com and then slash forward, optimal hyphen health slash forward. And you can download the CHIP Optimal Diet Guide. I hope this is going to be helpful to you. It has always been a pleasure in working with Chef AJ. I mean, she is doing more than anybody that I know of on a consistent basis in reaching out to the world and saying, you are in charge. You can do it. And I'm standing behind you. And you got the proof too. Amen. Have you, written? you have another, I, I just noticed, uh, Chef AJ, you have another new book out, right? Oh, uh, Glenn Mercer. Yeah. 
Actually, I did. Yeah, I know you, you, you wrote the forward to my very first book. Yes, Own Your Health. Yep. 81 new recipes by me, 35 by contributors. Thank you for mentioning it. I appreciate Amazing. That. And your book, my, my, you know, I have my, my roots are in Germany. And my sister told me, she said, there's a book out here in Germany written by Chef AJ. You are on the German market. I mean, I, I know, I know. Like the, yeah. my, my second book, The Secret Soul for My Weight Loss, was published in Germany. And it's called, and I can't read this, Das Erfrucht. Well, maybe you could tell me what it says. It's a, it's a great book. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Deal, do you have time for a couple of questions? As a matter of fact, you are competing with my book just that came out in Germany a few months ago, too. So we are flooding the market now, right? That's fantastic. Who is better than one? I just want to thank Vegan Trucker Lady and Maria for their super chat donations. Do you have a few more moments for a couple of questions, Dr. Sure. Deal? Okay. So people have been uh, typing them in the chat. Um, so TS says, does eating whole food plant-based dissolve fat that is in the arteries or does it just stop more fat from going into the arteries? That's a very good question. Uh, there is excellent research since the 1990s by Dr. Ornish, by Dr. Esselstein and several researchers that have found again and again and again, um, you can take a person with advanced atherosclerosis people with angina pain, people that have had bypass surgery and the arteries are closing up again because nobody told these people, you got to make some changes. No more smoking. You've got to go on the right diet. You have to get your exercise program going. They find over and over again within one year's time and that's what's found in months that these arteries begin to open up again. The plaque, even these are very powerful, almost fossilized calcified plaques to begin to open up again. And uh, you see, when you can open up these arteries by 10, 15, 20%, the blood can flow really much, much easier and bring the oxygenated blood to the heart muscle. And so the heart muscle is no longer screaming out, I am hypoxic, I am lacking oxygen here. The blood is not coming in the right amount. I need optimal blood flow. Restoration begins within weeks. So yes, we can reverse atherosclerosis. Part of that, of course, also means that you do something about your diabetes, right? Because diabetes is one of the factors that promotes atherosclerosis and cause a narrowing of these very small and larger vessels. Nice, thank you. Gina wants to know, how can the average person get their arteries checked, especially if they don't think they already have heart disease? Oh, uh, one of the best indicators is, uh, when you get your cholesterol down to the 160, 150 level, you have a pretty good idea that things are beginning to happen on the inside of the arteries. Um, when you begin to do something about your diet and you cut back on your salt, your blood pressure comes down, you know that it's contributing to the reversal of uh, atherosclerotic plaques in your arteries. When you begin to lose some weight, you know something is happening on the inside of the arteries as well. So you don't have to have fancy tests. You know, some people can have angiograms. You know, you spend, um, you know, a good amount of money for this. Uh, we don't usually recommend it unless it's really, uh, you know, uh, you have symptoms of uh, pain uh, because uh, after all, one in 500, one in a thousand angiograms, these extras of the arteries, of the coronary arteries is deadly. So, you know, there's no need for it. If you have no more pain, um, if your cholesterol is down to the 150, you know that you're in the process of, in all likelihood, regressing, reversing the plaque on the inside. Very good, thank you. Carrie says, is type one diabetes also linked to atherosclerosis? Yes, it is. Um, and uh, when it comes to type one diabetes, uh, there is an outstanding man by the name of the Mango Man, they call him. Um, he uh, has a website called Mastering Diabetes. He's specializing in type 1 diabetes, and he has shown in his own life and in thousands of people with type 1 diabetes that appropriate dietary changes can also begin to, what shall I say, to diffuse the, um, the ever-present danger of artery narrowing 
and the complications that we have in the vascular area uh, in type one diabetics. So there's good news uh, in our program, uh, in the CHIP program, we have not consistently found that we can reverse type one diabetes, but usually the physicians have to cut the insulin usually in half on the, you know, within a few months. Uh, they're on only half the amount of insulin. So there's something happening there, which is very, very good. But we're very, very uh, careful not to make claims that we make for type two diabetes. Right. Uh, Connie says, does atherosclerosis impact cancer? I don't know exactly how to answer that. Uh, um, it's a good question. Um, I leave that unanswered. Okay, terrific. Okay. Let's see. I am looking for there. There were so many. Uh, 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 sorry, I know there was more. It's just that there. there there's quite the easy many. ones. <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, you're, our, our friend Sid Nodder is watching, and you, you, I know you also endorsed her wonderful book, The Plan A Diet. She said it's so hard to convince diabetics about intramyocellular fat. They've been convinced it's the carbs, not the fat. Then how do you account for Dr. Walter Kempner, who reversed diabetes with white rice, fruit juice, and sugar? Yeah, and this goes back to the 1950s um, and 60s, Dr. Kempner. Outstanding. He inspired Nathan Pritikin to look at this. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's, uh, it's a diet that was very, very low in fat. There was no fat in that diet. And so even though he used white rice, it turned out to be okay. <clears throat> yep. And Vilma says, how long does it take for the insulin receptors to open up? Oh, that probably happens within days. Yeah, because you can see that uh, the blood sugars drop very, very rapidly. In three to four days on the CHIP program, we always have to make sure to tell the uh, participant, be sure you see a physician because we don't change the medication. We're working with the physicians out in the community. See a physician because you are in trouble because your blood sugars is dropping too far, too, too fast. Uh, you need to be on less medication, cut back on the medication. They're absolutely shocked. The physicians are shocked. The patient is shocked. You have more power as a patient that has diabetes than you ever realized. You are the person in charge, just like Beverly, right? She said, I'm the CEO. I'm in charge of my health. She's 86 now. Remember bypass surgery, retinopathy, uh, kidney disease, I mean, everything went wrong. And then you have Dr. Dr. Greenlaw, her physician, who was also our medical director for the CHIP program in Rockford, Illinois, where we had some 5,000 people enrolled in the program. Uh, you know, he said, the amazing thing is you treat one with this kind of a concept, you treat all. You don't just treat one chronic disease, but they all seem to respond because they're all connected through the circulatory system. Great. A couple of questions on metformin. How exactly does it work and what are some of the side effects from taking it? Don't know exactly. I'm not a physician. I'm more of an educator that is a health scientist, epidemiologist. So, you know, these are things that perhaps uh, we need to take a look at uh, by going to see Dr. Google. Right. Or, well, I'm sure right. we'll have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's, right. he's everybody's doctor this yeah, day. Every, yeah. Let's they, see. <clears throat> what about pasta? Is pasta okay? Lucy wants to know for someone who's pasta started. is okay, especially if you use unrefined flour. Use whole grain pasta and you're fine. Just don't put all the fat and oil on it. Right? Absolutely. And they make pastas with one ingredient now, like just legume, just, you know, just out of soybeans or yes. just out of black beans. So that they don't make, you don't have to get one that's made from flour products. What's this special creamy sauce that they always add to pasta? Uh, Alfredo sauce. Yeah. You know, even if you have whole grain pasta, don't put Alfredo sauce on top. You just destroying it, right? It's well, just I, have, I have an Alfredo blended. sauce in my book that's actually made out of- uh, Well, you know, but that's, that's, right, I, that's a special way. That's your way, that's good. Uh, you know, it's just like you have a, a good salad. You know, you have all the wonderful greens in there and then you douse it with all the creamy, fatty dressings and you basically undermine the goodness that you have just 
cover it up. Hey, S, it's great to be with you. I have an appointment coming up. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Deal. I really appreciate it. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We're doing the shows later this week because of the GI Health Summit, which I hope you'll join us for every day from 8 a.m. till noon Pacific time. And tomorrow, the guest is Dan Butner. He wrote many books about the Blue Zones. Thanks again, Dr. Deal. Be well. I'm calling you from the Blue Zone of Loma Linda. You'll hear the story (laughs) continue tomorrow by my friend Dan Butner. Enjoy it.